give a synopsis of conditions that will occur or that will be extant when just prior to his return to this earth. <clears throat> In response to a question from his disciples to tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming. Let us turn to Matthew chapter 24 and I want to look at a few of them. Matthew 24 and <clears throat> let's start from verse 21. He said, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And verse 22, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And then he gives a whole lot of other things that uh, you can uh, follow up and read. Now these conditions seem to coincide with another set of events. Let us turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 30. And we read a bit more here. Jeremiah chapter 30, and let's read from verse 4. It says, And these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and of not of peace. Ask you now and see whether a man doth travail with child, whether a man gets pregnant and walks around with a babe. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. Now, Christ said the condition that he was talking about. It will never be again. There was nothing like it. So that there can be two different things that are going to be none like it. There must be coinciding events. So what is meant being mentioned here in Jeremiah must of necessity coincide with what uh, Christ is, is detailing in, in Matthew. Uh, so that none is like it. And he says, it is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Uh, verse 10 mentions, uh, For lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and shall be uh, in rest and be quiet. And none shall make him afraid. And verse 11 says, For I am with thee, says the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee and measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. So we're looking at two events. One is called Jacob's trouble, and the one Christ described as the time of the end. And there seems to be, uh, they coincide. So today, brethren, we want to look at Jacob's trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble, and see what signs there may be on the horizon today. Now first, who is Jacob? Let's go to the book of Genesis.
Genesis chapter 48. And let's start from verse 1. And it says, And it came to pass after these things, that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jacob, and said, Behold, thy son, Joseph, comes unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat on the bed. So we can see here that Israel and Joseph and Jacob are the same person. Jacob, in fact, was one of the sons of Isaac. Uh, the second born, there were twin sons actually, and Jacob was born uh, just after his elder brother Esau, maybe a couple of minutes. And we know of the story of the children of Israel being in Egypt. One of his sons, whom he had uh, with his second wife, Joseph, is now comes to him. And apparently, uh, Jacob is close to departing this life, as they say. And here's what he says in verse 3. Now Jacob, his name was changed to Israel at a point in time early on in his life because if you remember the story of him wrestling with uh, an angel, actually it turned out to be God himself manifesting as a human being. And it says, And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And said unto me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a multitude of people. And I will give this land to your seed after you for an everlasting possession. And now he's, he turns the conversation back to Joseph. And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I came unto thee into Egypt. Those two sons are mine. As Reuben and Simeon shall they be mine. And thy issue, or if you have any children, which thou begettest after them, if you have children after these two boys, they will be now yours. But these two boys you got here, they are mine. They're no longer yours. As your brothers Simeon and Levi are my children, this is how these boys are now going to be considered. And I see, uh, and I issue which thou begettest after them shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. Meaning that when they go to inherit uh, whatever lands, whatever children he may have then, will inherit in the same lands that Ephraim and Manasseh uh, will get their inheritance. And let's pick up the story in verse 8. And Israel, Israel and Jacob, they're the same person. Israel is his, the name that God gave to him. Jacob is the name that his parents gave to him. So Israel and Jacob are the same person. And Israel, a.k.a. Jacob, saw Joseph's two sons and said, Whose are these? And Joseph said unto his father, so we see again, Jacob is the father of Joseph. They are my sons, whom God has given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. And let's drop down to verse 12. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees. Apparently they were small, so he holding them in front of him like this. So he ushering them to his father. And he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, towards Israel, or Jacob's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand, towards Israel, or Jacob's right hand. So little children brought like this. 
And Israel, or Jacob, stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger. You remember Manasseh, however, went to his right hand. That's how Jacob did it. And he put Ephraim, the younger, like this. But then Jacob did this. And he crossed his hands. And he put his right hand on the head of Ephraim, the younger one. And he said, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, a note, and let my name be named on them. And the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Now his name was Jacob, and at this point in time also Israel. And he's saying, let my name be named on these two boys, or the lads as they said here. So, let's continue. Well, but let's take a note of what is happening here. And when Joseph, verse 17, when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head onto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father Jacob, Israel, refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall be a people, and he also shall be great. So he is saying Manasseh will be great. But truly his younger brother, Ephraim, shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Verse 20, And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless saying, God make thee as Ephraim and Manasseh. And he said, Ephraim and Manasseh before... I uh, said, Ephraim before Manasseh. So we see that Jacob is the name that was given to the progenitor of the tribes of Israel. As his birth name. But God changed that to Israel. And now we see here in this instance, he is saying, let my name be named upon two of his grandchildren from uh, the firstborn son of his second wife, Joseph. Now, within that society, the firstborn son got a lot of blessings and material things. And in this particular instance, because Joseph was his favorite son, and if you read the entire chapter, he, he thought his sons played a trick on him when they sold Joseph into slavery, and he never thought he would see the boy in life again. And perhaps motivated by that also, that here it is, the son that he thought was dead, he now got to see. He gave him a double portion as it were, give him more. See verse 22. And verse 21 says, And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I'm about to die, but God shall be with you and bring you again into the land of your father. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above thy brethren. So he given him a double portion, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and, and, and my bow. And verse 49, well, we'll get to that in a while. But this scenario here, we see Jacob, or Israel, giving blessings of material things. And he says, great, greatness. Now, to both Ephraim and Manasseh, he says, Manasseh shall become a people. So he isn't giving them personally the blessings there. He said, Manasseh shall become a people, and he shall also be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed 
shall become a multitude of nations. And he saying to them, at this point in time, let my name be named on them. So the, 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 the people who will come out of Manasseh and who will come out of the younger brother Ephraim, he said, let my name be named on them. Not under just the two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, because when they are gone, what happens then? So the two boys were to become or to be known as Israel and Judah somewhere later on. Oh, sorry, Israel and as it mentioned in, 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 in Jeremiah, the prophecy was being directed to Israel, meaning the two boys. And Judah, one another of the sons to whom it says that Judah shall get the scepter. So the nation of Israel is not the little group of people we have in the Middle East today. It was these two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, that Jacob said, let my name be named on them. And one of them is going to be the greatest nation, as it says. And the younger one is a single nation, and the younger one shall be a multitude of nations and be greater than his elder brother. So, when the Bible is speaking about Jacob's trouble, it isn't talking about Jacob, the man, because he's dead, is referring to the nations that came out of him. And we see here, specifically, the nation being referred to are the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, that Jacob transferred this blessing to before he died. Now who are the lads? The lads as we see in verses 8 to 9 are the sons, his grandsons. The, son of his the, the, the sons of his favorite son Joseph whom he gave uh, the coat of many colors. That caused his brothers to hate him. And eventually got him sold into slavery. And all the blessings that he mentioned here are going to be transferred to these two uh, nations at a particular point in time. And let's drop down to chapter 49 and look at verse 1. It says, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Now, obviously, uh, again, while he is giving, uh, the, the, he's speaking to them, the blessings will not be transferred to them as individuals, but it is going to go to the, the tribes, the nations that will develop from them. And it says, in the <coughs> last days. So long after they have gone, that is when it is going to happen. In the last days. Just prior to the time when Christ will come, as we see uh, the similar thing Christ said in the last days. So, leading up to that time, the blessings are going to be on these, these boys. Now, Jacob also expanded some of these blessings here. Let us go back to Genesis chapter 35. And let's go from verse 9. Remember, he told Joseph that, you know, God met him on the way. Let's see where God met him on the way. Verse 9, it says, And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Pandaram, and blessed him. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob. But Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. 
And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave unto Abraham and Isaac, to you will I give it, and to thy seed after you will I give the land. And we see Jacob, Israel, repeating the same promise here. A nation and a company of nations shall come, shall be of thee. God is telling him that. And he repeated that to his, uh, verse 19 he says, And he shall also be a people, and he shall also be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. At this point in time, Was it the intent of God that Ephraim should be? I don't know. Maybe not. But at the time when Jacob decided to pass on the blessing, apparently he made the decision as to which one of the boys would be the greater one. Uh, or maybe God had revealed it to him, but it's not clear exactly that this was God's intent. So, here we have the situation being set up. And these boys will have great dominion and wealth, etc. And at some point in time, in the last days, these situations are going to come to fruition. They will get all of the blessings and the power, become a great nation. Now, just let me go back to Verse 48, chapter 48. When it says that these two boys are mine, and verse 22 in the first part, he says, Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren. It would give unprecedented power and wealth and prestige, apparently, that no other nation in this world would ever have ever gotten. Now, these two nations have been identified as Britain and Manasseh, as Britain and, and, and the United States today. Britain being Ephraim and Manasseh being the United States. Now some people have said that we're taking a reality today and attempting to extrapolate from uh, circumstances and biblical statements. Uh, one person said to me, why couldn't the same description be applied to Babylon? Well, it couldn't. Well, first of all, because Babylon, Babylon that had greatness and national power and achievement was conquered by the Medo-Persians and that Babylon is no more. You know, and it never rose again to be a world power. Secondly, the prophecies were directed to two brothers who were identified as descendants of a Hebrew family. And these prophecies were for the last days. Babylon, uh, the physical nation of Babylon, no longer has any presence of that statue in the world. After they were conquered by the Medes and the Persians, they never rose to any level of, 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 of uh, greatness that they had before. And further, the two boys would be progenitors of tribes that would be in a federation with 11 other tribes descended from their uncles. And Babylon was never so identified. So it couldn't refer to Babylon. And let's note what God said that he will do for those boys. God is saying this now long in advance. By the time uh, Jacob, etc., came around, 
Babylon had some measure of, of, of uh, existence as, as a nation already. Let's look at Deuteronomy. And let's go from verse 1. It says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken, oh sorry, uh, yeah. if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God. 28. Deuteronomy 28 verse 1. To observe and do all his commandments which I command thee this day. That the Lord will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. So that God was saying to them, I will make you greater than any nation that ever existed. And verse 2, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if you hearken unto the voice of your Lord. And he gives them a whole lot of blessings there. You can read that on your own. And let's drop down to... Uh, verse 11, it says, And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, of your land, and the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give thee rain in your land in his season, and to bless all the work of thy hand. And note, and you shall lend to many nations, and you shall not borrow. And the Lord shall make you the head and not the tail. And you shall be above only. And you shall not be beneath. And there's the condition. If that you hearken unto the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day to observe and to do. But he also promised them that if they disobeyed him, he would punish them. First by removing by the material blessings and by diminishing their military power thus causing them to go into captivity. And you can read that in the rest of the chapter. <clears throat> Verse 25 of the same chapter says, The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies and you shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and you shall be removed unto all kingdoms of the earth. And a whole lot of Punishments that was uh, listed here, in, uh, which you can read in the rest of the chapter. Now, <coughs> Jesus Christ made a decisive statement about the fate of a nation, or a family, or any form of grouping. Let's read what he says in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew, sorry, Matthew 12, and let's drop down to verse 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house, family, divided against itself shall not stand. And today, brethren, at the time when it says that Israel, Ephraim and Manasseh, would have these blessings, we are seeing conditions that parallel what Christ says here. Every kingdom divided against itself. And if we look at the nations of Israel, Ephraim and Manasseh, and Judah, we are seeing a similarity in conditions. All three of them is experiencing divisions. In the United States, divisions such as never been seen before. They are having problems in government. All three of them at the same time. Let's look at the problems of the 
the divisions in government that the United States is facing, which you've been seeing in the media. We know what happened with the elections. President Obama won the presidency from Hillary Clinton, who many wanted to make the first president or female president of the United States. But President Obama became the first African American to be appointed president. And apparently that upset the plans of many interest groups within the United States. But apparently he and some of the persons that he appointed are members of the Democratic Party set up a machinery that would have seen Hillary Clinton being ushered in after him as the first female president of the United States. But then a man from nowhere who had no political involvement or experience, Donald Trump, suddenly turned up in the Republican Party and after being dismissed by so many, up to the very week of the election for the presidency, the, the polls were, were showing Hillary Clinton as a clear winner so that they didn't take his challenge very seriously. Until the night when the returns were coming in and they began to recognize that there's a possibility that this guy could win. He won't win the popular vote but in the Electoral College, because this, the way they set things up in the United States, in order to prevent the larger states from dominating small ones, they gave small states a certain number of electoral votes, where each state has a certain number, and then uh, whichever uh, party wins the state, in the popular vote, gets the electoral votes. And as it turned out, Mr. Trump collected enough of these votes to win the presidency. And that triggered off a frenzy and hostility and anger and hatred as you have never seen. There is not a single day from that time that you look in the media, that this current president isn't vilified, isn't belittled, isn't ridiculed, everything he does. I mean, the most recent incident uh, of killing the, the, the man, uh, the general in, in Iraq, that and all is bringing uh, criticisms. But when Bar Bar Barack Obama killed this Osama bin Laden, there was, you know, exaltation. Nobody foresaw killing uh, Osama bin Laden as something that would precede a war. But that is the, the, the agenda that this goes. And with the bombing of Benghazi, Libya, etc., nobody mentioned that, hey, you're destabilizing a country. But had he done that, in the killing one man who everyone knew and would the United Nations had, had listed as a terrorist. Internally now, there are persons who are opposed and op expressing opposition to that act. And I mean, I, 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 I listened to a broadcast by persons who were in the media. And they were describing the funeral of, I mean, they took time to go and cover the funeral of this man. And they described it as if this person was some member of the United States Congress or some prominent person in the United States who died. They regarded him as a great man and they're describing now the response of the people uh, who were attending the funeral. 
and they're expressing sympathy, as it were, almost, with uh, the, the country and the nation of Iran. Most recent thing that is happening is uh, this. Well, Iran apparently has admitted to shooting down its own aircraft. <laughs> But the media within the United States is finding a way to blame the President of the United States for that act. The operatives who were left in government, the director of the CIA, conspired to undermine the President before he got into the office. And then he got before Congress and he lied and they asked him questions and he suddenly had amnesia. He didn't remember. I don't remember. I can't remember. And then when he went out there, he wrote a whole book detailing what he had done, which in many instances would, 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 would constitute acts of treason. And then the, 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 the Democratic Party and the supporters in the media were so intent on destroying the president that the issue, they got a, 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 a former a former uh, intelligence officer from Britain to prepare a dossier which was given to the Democrats in which it later turned out was filled with untruths half-truths, fabrications. And that was used as the basis of going to a court to prepare a warrant to investigate the president for criminal activity. And they hired a attorney, spent how many millions of dollars over more than two years to attempt to link the president with intrusion by the Russians to engineer the election in his favor. Now, a report was made by the office of the inspector general, apparently somebody who gives a report on the activities of the government. That person said the FBI's handling of the Carter Page applications was a Carter Page was someone who worked for uh, the, 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 the Trump campaign. As portrayed in the, the Office of the Inspector General's report was antithetical to the heightened uh, duty of candor described previously. The frequency with which representations made by FBI personnel turned out to be unsupported or contradicted by information in their possession and with which they withheld information detrimental to their case calls into question whether information contained in other FBI applications is reliable. And this was written by a judge, Rosemary Collier, who wrote in an order from the court that was published. The FBI Inspector General, Michael Horowitz, uh, the FBI, Michael, he found, had changed or withheld significant information used to build this application to surveil this person who was a member of the Trump's campaign, with the intent of indicting him to then have him, as they say, say something derogatory about the president that could lead to further action. The FBI attorney who changed the information is now under criminal investigation. So that was how far the opposition, the political party, the opposite party, was prepared to go to get its operatives who were in the government 
to actively seek to undermine the current president. And so it, it goes. They got the Mueller probe. Spent years. I heard one news organization say they sent reporters into places where this report claimed that the president had done whatever. And for two months they had their reporters going around and they could find nothing. But you would not hear this on especially the television and radio stations. They are intent on dragging this president down. Right now they're looking to have impeachment. Impeachment is a serious thing. And even though many have said impeachment will never succeed because first of all they have nothing which could impeach him. All the impeachment could do is damage the United States and the image of the presidency. They are prepared to go forward and this is as though the hatred of the president is so great that they are blinded in their actions. They had someone who was a, supposedly a whistleblower who leaked to the media what he supposedly overheard the president say in a private phone conversation to the Ukrainian president. And when eventually they were able to question that person, he essentially lied. He essentially was saying, well, that was my interpretation of something that somebody else told me. So someone tells me that Junior says this. I didn't hear it myself. But my impression is, because Junior said it, it means that he is guilty of something. And therefore this person went and he spread that to the media and they ran with this thing. And so what we see today, brethren, is the United States divided as never before. But Christ said, any nation that is divided against itself cannot stand. And we see in Deuteronomy, God says that He will bring He will bring down the nations of Israel, the two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh is now uh, the single nation, and we're seeing the divisions, fierce divisions. I mean, we had a whole thing by a person from Hollywood, and one of them said if she had it within her power, she would drop a bomb on the White House. That is how far the hatred has gone. And you saw all of these groups who were demonstrating. So the division in the United States is so great. You now have socialists and communists in the Congress. You have some of them running for the presidency. Now imagine in a country that is known for being the leader of the world in capitalism. Socialists are running for the presidency. The ideas of some of the persons who are in the, the, the presidents, in, in, in the, the Congress, if implemented, will most likely destroy the United States. One person uh, put forward an idea to the greening of, a, of, of America that Every building, public building, and I imagine it will extend to maybe homes eventually, but every public building should be made quote unquote green friendly. And somebody estimated that it would cost over $90 trillion to do that. Now, where does any nation get $90 trillion from? Uh, is, is, is no, the United States is already in debt um, in excess of $22 trillion. Another person said that every business in the United States 
that has revenues in excess of one trillion dollars or one billion dollars should be taken over by the government. Now, government taking over business is the essence of what socialism or communism is all about. And someone who is a senator in this government of the United States is proposing that any business with revenues of over a billion should be seized and taken over by the government. And persons who are wealthy, they should be taxed. About 75% of their wealth would be taken away in the first instance. And whatever they have left in the, 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 increase, the years ahead, there will be a, a progressive tax they continue to take away more. These ideas and persons who are supporting them, again, unprecedented in this country. And this is one. Across the pond, as they say. In Britain. With Brexit. Now remember we, 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 we talked about uh, the prediction that Mr. Armstrong made that Britain will not be part of the final... Uh, whatever the EU morphs into. Britain will not be part of it because of this very sad uh, prophecy that God will punish the nations of Israel, again, not the little country down there, but the nation, Ephraim and Manasseh, Ephraim being Britain, out of whom came a company of nations, and you had a number of nations coming out of them. You have Canada and Australia and New Zealand, South Africa, etc., coming out of them. And the company of nations that they developed eventually called the Commonwealth, and so many of these countries who had uh, government instruments, etc., and structures modeled on the British um, parliamentary style, etc. So that even today we still have the Commonwealth being maintained and the nations having the commonality of the same types of institutions and government, uh, bringing public administration, etc. to uh, modern nations. But look what happened in that country when the decision to exit from the European Union was put before the, the country. Massive demonstrations on either side. Some, the majority said they wanted to leave. But an elite group within Britain apparently was opposed to it. And so when the then Prime Minister resigned and passed it on to someone else to attempt uh, the, the Brexit, as it was called, to leave the European Union, they saw it as an opportunity to thwart Theresa May. And we saw the difficulties that she experienced. She had members of her own party opposing her. She was forced ultimately to resign. And then she passed it on to Boris Johnson. And if you would have read and heard some of the negative things that were said, I mean his own brother got up and said that he wasn't fit to be Prime Minister. The Speaker of the House refused to serve in the House, with Boris Johnson being elected Prime Minister, and all of the criticisms that went against him, if you read them, they were bitter. Almost the same as within the United States. And in fact, after he won the Prime Ministership, again, uh, many thought that, 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 that Labour with the Jeremy uh, Corbyn would have won the election. And again, here comes this man out of nowhere 
and wins the Prime Ministership. And almost immediately after he won it, members of the media began to speculate that the Russians had done as they did under Trump and helped him to do that. Where that will go, we don't know, but we saw how far it went in the United States, and it continues. It will not stop, you know. They went and they found the, what was she, with, um, an exotic, um, whatever, Stormy Daniels, with whom the president allegedly had some kind of dalliance. But, I mean, the, the Democratic presidents have done similar, if not more, you know. We had one president being um, outed, as they say, and had to go before the American uh, public. But he will go down as one of the more popular presidents of the United States. And when you read of his actions in, in the White House and Monica Lewinsky and all of the other women that he was involved with, all that was shut up. Nobody would mention it. And then before him, with President Kennedy, Marilyn Monroe, and all of the rest. So, this president, if he did have whatever with this person, everything he does will be they look at in an attempt to denigrate him. But with a, a, a democratic president, they will shut it up because this is who they favor. And now we see Britain doing the same thing with the current Prime Minister. So that the problems now with Brexit, they remain. And the negotiations, we need now to see how the persons who are opposed, again, different arms of the government, they want to see a socialist type of government introduced. How would that go about? And then we now have Israel, or the nation that is referred to in the Bible here as Judah. The current Prime Minister is facing similar difficulties, this time to form a government. He had two elections. He failed to get the, what, the first to form a, a government the first time around. The persons who were in a coalition with him before refused to cooperate. And after a couple of months, he was forced to dissolve the, the parliament and return to the polls, which he again won, but again did not get enough seats to form a government on his own. And so they're going to have to go to another election in order to see if they could resolve this difficulty in government. But in the interim, his attorney general charged him with corruption. Again, they said that was unprecedented. And what the attorney general deemed to be corruption apparently was a favorable report in the media about Mr. Netanyahu. It is favorable and therefore, in order for that to be so, it has to be that the Prime Minister was engaged in some kind of corruption to get that kind of a report. And so he took that matter <coughs> and made a charge against it. So here it is, the Prime Minister of the country is being charged with a, a criminal act. What's going to happen with that? Apart from denigrating him, we don't know. Uh, the matter is not yet resolved one way or the other. When the other election comes up, we will see. But until then, Israel is experiencing instability in government. So the three, or the two nations, the three of them, Israel, Ephraim and Manasseh, and Judah, are experiencing a same type of divisions. And Christ is saying that any nation divided against itself, and as divided as these are, cannot stand. 
So the question is, how long will they last for? Some say that there was some kind of intervention taking place because uh, the two most unlikely people to win an election got the presidency in the United States are now in Britain. And in Britain, uh, the Prime Minister there won seats that they, had, they hadn't won for what, 80 years, if they had ever won at all. They won seats in Labour. And now the leader of the opposition was forced to resign. When, while he was in, 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 in the opposition seats, um, consorted with all sorts of people, including dictators and socialist communists. And he opposed this Prime Minister in some of the bitterest terms. So, brethren, these conditions that they are occurring in these three countries mentioned here in Jeremiah at the same time, and the outcome that Christ said it will have, no country detied against itself like that cannot stand. He said they cannot stand. To the extent that all three are experiencing similar things. And their fall coincides with the time of the end. I think it, 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 it is a, a warning to us or signs to us that we should be looking closely at them to see where they go. Because if we see a decline such that, uh, for example, you have a collapse in the economy, Other nations are waiting in the wings to take over the leadership of the world and they are not democratic by any means. The fall of Britain and the United States will result in China and the EU emerging. And as we know, China is a communist and a dictatorship. The EU will ultimately turn out to be somewhat dictatorial in, in, in how it operates. And if that happens, then we know that Christ's return is not far away. And it said that we needed to watch and pray so that we should not be lulled into accepting conditions that might be extended at any point in time and which may appear to be favorable, and life might appear to be nice. It will not be because it said there shall be great tribulation, it says, such as not, uh, has not ever been since there was a nation. And so, brethren, let us watch and see how these things go, because linked to them is the return of Christ, and the signs that he mentioned, we should begin to see being manifested in the not-too-distant future.